Friends, we are in the middle of a worship series called Again, Lord, and we are looking into the scripture, not just for knowledge, not just for patterns, not just for metaphors, but we are looking into scripture to see the character of our unchanging God and to remind ourselves that the ways that God showed up in creation then are the same ways that God shows up in creation now. We're looking back in this season so that we can learn how to pray again, Lord, for the same kinds of revelation and vision and deliverance and supplication and providence that our ancestors have received in the past because God is unchanging. So I invite you to listen uh, to these words, just part of the story of Gideon, and we're going to learn the rest of his story next week. But hear these words of scripture and hear in them more than a story, but hear in them the nature of our God. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves dens in the caves and the strongholds which are in the mountains. And so it was whenever Israel had sown, Midians would come up and also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number and they would enter the land to destroy it. And so Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and I drove them out before you and gave you their land. And also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And then the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So Gideon said to God, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. And then Gideon said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, Show me a sign that it's you who talk with me. Don't depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. And then the angel of the Lord put the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. 
and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. And to this day, it is still in Ophrah of the Abyssalites. And now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement, and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In order to understand this story, you need to know something about the one story of God restoring creation. So this story takes place after the chosen people have entered into the promised land. And what you need to know is that God had a design, a vision, a plan, a covenant for how God's people were to live together in the promised land. And they were to live in peace and in mutuality, in interdependence, in shalom. They were to live in freedom and not in fear everyone bound together by love of God and love of neighbor. So if you read the book of Judges in scripture, you'll see that plan. When God sent the people into the promised land, each person belonged to a family, a clan, and each clan had a piece of land. And there were priests in the land, but there were no kings and there were no governors. Everyone lived together by the covenant of Moses and all of life was worship before God. And when a problem came up, because problems do, when an enemy threatened, whether that enemy was external or internal, an angel of the Lord would come and tap somebody on the shoulder, would raise up a judge, a person of deep maturity, and put a spiritual anointing on them, and that person would lead the people in that time of crisis. And then after the crisis was resolved, that person would remain as a source of wisdom and reconciliation, and those people were called judges. And the vision that God had for the people was to return life and community as closely as possible to the way it was in the Garden of Eden, where people lived together and enjoyed the goodness of creation and lived before God, not under the authority of government or kings or noble or class. Nobody had power over anybody else. Everyone mutually submitted to God. And this was a very beautiful and a very inefficient system. There's a pattern in Judges if you read it. There's a crisis, a judge is raised up, that person leads well, at least in the first half of the book, the people will worship God, um, resolve, receive salvation, they will live in peace, and then the judge will die, and the people will creep. They will keep the parts of the covenant that seem really important to them, the central parts, but then just kind of let go of some of the awkward and inefficient parts that didn't seem wise in their own eyes. And they were living in the promised land, and they were not the first or the only people to live there, and they would look around at the other people of other ethnicities, and those folks had their own tribal gods. There was Baal, the storm and fertility god, and the people would worship him because promised that if you just made a few sacrifices at his altar, you'd get good crops and lots of kids, lots of wealth, and who doesn't want that? And it's not like we're going to stop worshiping Baal, we're just going to add a little bit of Baal worship. You know, it's just a little tradition, a little, a little quirk. Um, just throw a quick few Hail Marys over there. Cover your bases, you know? And then Baal had a wife, so you don't want to leave her out. Her name was Asherath, and she was the queen of heaven, and she was really into trees, and it was trees were important in the desert. And it was nice to just throw up a pole to honor her. You know, you want to give the ladies something, right? 
So you just spend the little time every day thinking about these stories and thinking about her traditions and she helps with fertility and childbirth and there's nothing wrong with that and we're not doing this instead of God. We're just doing this along with God. And so over time, when things are going well, the people get just a little less serious about keeping the covenant and a little more serious about Baal and the worship of Asherah. They get a little less interested in remembering and pondering the stories they inherited from their ancestors about who God is and how God was calling them to live and what God's plan for the restoration of all creation is and what their part of it is. And they get a little more intrigued and interested in the unfamiliar and novel stories and the promises of Baal and Asherah. And then, and then who has time for religion anyway? Because disaster strikes. Out of nowhere, there are these war parties from Midian that start coming in and raiding the people and invading the land. And they would come in so strong that the people would leave their houses and just run to the hills and hide in caves. And they'd come back after the bands moved on and they would just find that everything was destroyed. Their crops were burned, their animals had been slaughtered, or even worse, they would watch from the hills, and, and the Midianites were savvy. And so they would just let the Israelites spend a whole year raising a field of crops, sowing and tending and harvesting grain. And they would wait until the Israelites had done all the work of harvesting that and gathering it into their barns. And they would wait until the people had done all the work of threshing the wheat, which is how you separate the grain from the chaff. And I don't really know how that works. You could watch a YouTube video if you want to. But what I do know is in this process, a big cloud of dust comes up. And so the Midianites, they were like land pirates. They would wait up in the hills and think, why not work smarter, not harder? And why would we burn the crops when we can just let those puny little fools do all the work of harvesting it, wait until we see the cloud of dust, and then swoop in and take everything that is there. The scripture says that the Midianites were like clouds of locusts, swarms of locusts. They devoured every little thing. And when they moved on, the land they left behind was stripped. And so at this point, there's this great reversal, right? God's people are living and hiding in the caves. They are living on the run. They have no peace. And these nomads, these bands of wandering people have moved in and settled down and taken over. And in verse 6, things are so bad, the Midianites have impoverished the people so much that they cry out to God. And in verse 7, God sends them a prophet, and this prophet has no name, probably because nobody was very excited to hear from him or her, and says, hey, I am the God who delivered you from Egypt. I rescued you from slavery. I gave you this land. I gave you a place in it. I told you how to live. I told you not to worship the gods of this land, but you did not listen to me. And this is true, but it is not the kind of help that the people were looking for. But at the same time, an angel of the Lord goes and sits down under a tree in Ophrah. And the tree belongs to a man named Joash, and Joash had a son named Gideon. And Gideon is just trying to survive. He's not trying to be a hero. He's just trying to make it. And he's been working all year on his father's land, and they have harvested the crop, and he has come up with a plan that isn't very dignified, but will allow him to hold on to the fruits of their labor. So he takes the stalks of wheat, just a few at a time, into the bottom of a wine press. And you can think of it like a well, but it has a, a floor and uh, no water. It has a bottom. And instead of stomping out grapes in that wine press, he's down there threshing the wheat. So the cloud of dust is hidden by the walls of the wine press so that no one will see and come in and attack. So he's in the wine press and he's hunched over secretly trying to harvest wheat and an angel of the Lord shows up and says, greetings, mighty warrior. And that's funny. It's also kind of rude. <laughs> The angel of the Lord shows up with him and says, Greetings, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you. Last week, Nicole preached to us about how Hagar named God. She's the only person who does. And what she says is, You're the God who sees. 
And in this story, it's all about the things that God sees that no one else sees. God sees something in Gideon that no one else sees. No one else sees a mighty warrior in this man, not even Gideon. Gideon is not any kind of warrior, not yet, but he's a pretty decent theologian. So when the angel of the Lord shows up and says, greetings, mighty warrior, the Lord is with you, then Gideon has some questions. If the Lord is with me, then why has all this happened? Because I've heard the stories, God used to do really big, awesome things for us, like parting the seas and plagues on our enemies and manna and water from rocks, but none of that stuff is happening anymore. So God might have brought us out of slavery in Egypt, but nowadays we're pretty much slaves of Midian right here. God might have been good to us once, but God isn't very good to us anymore. Now, I just want to pause for a minute and celebrate how honest and relatable Gideon is. Because he just says out loud what every single one of us is thinking when tragedy strikes our lives. And Gideon is very scared of the Midianites, which is why he's crouching down in that wine press. But when an angel of the Lord shows up, he's pretty bold. Yeah, God is with me, okay, but what is that worth really? Gideon does not think very much of the God of his ancestors. And many of us, if we were desperate or honest enough, we would ask the same questions and make the same accusations when we face something terrible in our lives and we think, well, maybe God was good in the past or maybe God is good to somebody else over there. But right now, if you look at my life, clearly God has abandoned me. So maybe God isn't as good and kind and loving as we've been singing about all of these years. And I want you to notice what happens next. Please pay very close attention to the angel's response, because it doesn't sound like the response of any preacher or pastor that I've ever heard. What the angel says, and all of a sudden it's not an angel, all of a sudden if you're looking at the scripture, it turns from an angel of the Lord to the Lord. And when Gideon says these things, does he get vaporized? Does he get struck down with leprosy? Does he get thrown into the outer darkness where there's gnashing of teeth? Does he even get rebuked? None of those things. Questions, doubts, despair, confusion are part of being human. And the Lord loves honesty. And anyone who demands absolute, immediate, perfect, unquestioning loyalty and obedience is not God or speaking for God. God isn't trying to get things efficiently done by dismissing the reality of where we are. God is about the good work of redeeming and restoring relationship. So when Gideon makes these observations that sound rude and blasphemous to us, God says to him, and I love this so much, God says to him, go in the strength you have and you will save Israel out of Midian's hand. I am sending you. Go in the strength you have. I'm not getting a tattoo, but if I did, that would be a really good line. (laughs) Go in the strength you have to do the thing that I am sending you to do. See, our spirituality has been too shaped by Hollywood movies and not enough shaped by scripture. So if we were writing the script of this story, this is where we would cue the montage, right? Like the Rocky montage and God would be the trainer and we'd get the upbeat music and these really hard workouts over and over again. Gideon would be working hard and he'd get all buff and then he'd be sent out once he was strong to save the people. But God says, go in the strength you have. Start right now. And Gideon, again, he's a great theologian. He just tells the truth, which is, I'm not strong, God. I'm a wimp. Look at where you found me, hunched over in this wine press. I can't save Israel. My family is the weakest family in Israel, and I am the weakest of the weaklings. I can't do it. And God says... And this is the whole thing, church. God says, I will be with you. God says, go in the strength you have 
to do the thing I'm calling you to do. And however much or little strength or faith or ability you have, it's irrelevant because I will be with you. God does not call us to do things for him. God calls us to do things with him. God sees a way of living, a way of being in the world that we do not see. So God sees something in Gideon that no one sees, including Gideon. And then God sees a way to go towards salvation that we do not see. So we see a problem or we have a dream or we have a need. And we look at that and we see, well, either I can do this or I can't. Either I can change so that I can do it on my own or too bad. But God sees another way to live into the calling that we have in our lives. God says the way you follow me, is to go in the strength you have because you know that God is with you. So you go before you're ready. You go before you fully understand. You take the first step before you know what the last one will be, and this is the narrow road that Jesus is talking about. This is what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. Most of the time when people describe walking by faith, they may make it sound like walking by faith means you are walking in total confidence and security with absolutely everything you need and no doubts at all. That is a lie. Amen. This is what walking by faith looks like, knowing that you are the weakest of the weak and you have no strength at all. And God says, just start with what you have. Go this way, knowing that I am with you. Now, Gideon needs a little more reassurance and a little more proof. And again, I just want you to notice that God isn't mad. God is patient. God doesn't reject him and say, well, you asked too many questions now, son, you're out of here. God knows who Gideon is. And God knows what Gideon is capable of. And God knows what Gideon needs to do. So Gideon brings an offering and God consumes it with fire. And somehow that sign makes Gideon feel more confident, except that now he realizes, oh, this really is God. And I have a different problem now because I've seen you face to face. And I think that means I'm going to die or something. And God says, hey, peace. Don't be afraid. You're not going to die. And so Gideon builds an altar there at that spot and he names it God is peace, Yahweh Shalom. And I love thinking about that, that in that moment he hasn't changed at all. The strength of the enemies has not decreased. The threat has not decreased. All of the problems he had before he still has, and yet he names that altar, God is peace, because a shift is starting. But it's this very next part of the story that I really want us to pay attention to and it's such a great story. It's so rich that it's easy to just skip over this part. And I think it is the most significant part for us right now. So after Gideon gets his sign and he's ready, he's ready to do this and God gives him his first task. And from our eyes, the first thing that God asks him to do is a waste of time. It's inconsequential, and it's going to cause a lot of controversy, so in a lot of ways, it's actually counterproductive. God says to him, before we get started with the Midianites, before we have anything to do with those guys over there, before I have you call an army or give you a battle plan or prepare in any way for battle, the first thing you need to do is cut down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Before you go into the battlefield, you need to smash your idols. And you need to build a fire out of the broken pieces. And then you need to make an offering to me on that fire, on the newly built altar. And this is the third thing that God sees that we don't see. God sees something in Gideon that no one else sees. God sees something in you that no one else sees. God sees a way of following that no one else sees. Not to go when we're ready, but to go as we are. And the third thing that God sees that we don't see is God sees a problem that no one else sees. See, Gideon and his community, they think that their problem is the Midianites, they think that their problem is everybody else around them. And every moment of his life he has designed in response to that external threat. Gideon thinks his whole problem is external. 
But God says the Midianites are not your problem. The Midianites are a symptom of your problem. Your problem is your idols. Your problem and the problem of your people is that you claim me, but you do not worship me. And you do not worship me only. Now, just I want to put a caveat on here. This is a particular story, and it is applicable to particular places in your life and my life and the world. Not every place. Not every problem we have is a result of unfaithfulness on our part. But some of them are. God says, you do not worship me only, you worship me and Baal, me and Asherah, all the values and practices and customs that come along with those idols. Your problem is your idols, and that is the same for us. Because a lot of us know that there's something wrong in our lives. Jesus promised us life, abundant life, but no matter how we spin it, that's not what we're living we have stressful lives and angry lives and suffering lives and vicious lives. And Jesus says, hey, come unto me, you who are heavily burdened. My yoke is easy and my burden is light, but there is nothing easy or light about our lives. We are heavily burdened still. Sometimes loving Jesus feels like an additional burden on top of everything else. We are threatened. We work constantly and it is impossible to rest. But we believe in God, we love Jesus, we pray with desperation and we worship, but what is against us seems so much greater than what is for us. And most of us aren't as bold as Gideon in that wine press and we're afraid to ask, hey God, if you're with me, then why is this so hard? We don't even ask that question of ourselves. I believe that God is calling us as God is calling Gideon. God is calling us to live the way that God called Gideon in the strength that we have. And I believe that God is calling us to begin where God called Gideon to begin, which is in our own backyards, in our private lives, to tear down idols and make an altar to God. Now, practically, what does that look like? In Gideon's backyard, there was a literal shrine to Baal, a little platform with a wooden statue on it and a pole. There were physical objects that had to be destroyed and removed. And I know that none of y'all have little statues that you bow down to every day. But an idol doesn't have to be physical in order to be powerful in your life. An idol is any untrue thing that you orient your life around. An idol is any untrue thing that you devote time, attention, and energy to. And here's the kicker. You don't even have to really believe in it. You just have to make space for it in your life. So it could be the lie that how hard you work or how much you earn is what you're worth. It could be the myth of beauty, that your worth and value and belonging are contingent on how much you weigh or your physical strength or how other people evaluate your appearance. It could be a relationship that is enjoyable to you, but you know is out of line with your own values. It could be media you consume that fill your spirit with rage or despair. Or it could be media that you consume to artificially numb your pain to the brokenness of the world. It could be your fears or your dreams for your children that keep you from being present with them as they are. It could be the myth of redemptive violence or vengeance or consumerism. I don't know what your idols are. And what is an idol for one person might not be for another person. I don't know. But the Holy Spirit does. And what I do believe is that if you seek the Holy Spirit for revelation, if you ask the Holy Spirit, what is centered in my life that shouldn't be? What am I orienting my life around that is unhealthy and untrue? What is so familiar and common to me that I can't see its power? And what does it look like to tear that down? There's a spiritual exercise for all of us on the back of the grown-up bulletin, and I invite you to take it home. And I invite you to take some time this week to just seek the Lord around that question. And I, we called it homework as fun, but don't turn it in. <laughs> this is between you and the Lord only. But there's two parts to it. Gideon was called not just to tear something down, but to construct something holy in its place. 
out of the pieces Gideon is told to make an altar. And I believe God is calling us to do the same. If our wholehearted desire is to become the people God created us to be, if what we need is the grace to go in the strength we have to live the lives that God is calling us to live, to live them according to God's ways and not the ways of the culture, to live in God's strength and not limited by our own, then the center of our life has to be an altar to God. And again, this is probably not a physical material object, though who knows, I'm not the boss of you. <laughs> but it's probably a practice or a habit or a discipline whereby you regularly and consistently turn your focus and full attention toward God. Not once a week, not on a retreat, but in your daily life, orienting yourself to the values of the kingdom of God, reminding yourself of what is real and what is not, what is eternal and what is not, what God is doing in the world. Most of us spend the majority of our time, and I'm definitely talking about myself too, most of us spend the majority of our time reacting and listening to statements and visions that we don't believe in. We are mostly more passionate about what we're against than about what we're for. We have a good sense of what God isn't, but we need an altar in the center of our lives that orient us towards what God is a life-giving, restful reminder that God is peace at the center of our lives, no matter what is going on around us, a place to return to that reminds us that what matters most is not at stake. Whatever tomorrow brings, Jesus will still be risen. We live in a kingdom that will not fall. An altar at the center of your life is how Paul can say centuries later from prison, hey, we're hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For those, for we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life might be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Because Paul, whatever happens, is daily oriented toward the glory of Christ on the cross and the triumph of resurrection. After the worst has absolutely happened, then come the first fruits of salvation, which is the redemption of all creation. Your life looks different when that is at the center every day. But we have to worship at that altar so that we have the muscle memory so that when the storm comes, we don't panic, but we have peace. <laughs>